Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. So democracy seems to have survived for another day here in the United States, uh, no matter which side you're on. Hopefully you're pro-democracy one way or the other. Of course, we had a fun conversation with Cornell West the day before Election Day, but that was more about the spirit of democracy. Today, we're going to be talking about the history of of democracy. You know, again, as I said in a previous podcast, democracy is something we take for granted. We're just taught that it's good. It's a positive valence word that you can throw out there when you're talking to other people. But it's not obvious, right? It's not self-evident that democracy is the best kind of government. And certainly through history, places have been democratic and places have not been democratic. So how did it come to be democracy? And why did it sometimes go away, right? How did it both get invented and why did it sometimes get overturned? Today's guest is David Stasavage, who is Dean for the Social Sciences as well as a professor of politics at NYU. And he has a book out on the decline and rise of democracy, where it's a wonderful book, you know, very readable, big picture history kind of book. But he makes a couple of very interesting points that weren't obvious. One is that we think of, in our Western focused viewpoint, democracy as coming to be in Greece and then spreading to Rome and then kind of fading away before being rediscovered, which is a very inaccurate history of early democracy in David Stasavage's point of view. He thinks that early democracy was all over, and I shouldn't say he thinks. He points out correctly and obviously to any historian, early democracy was all over the place. Uh, there are many societies, groups, tribes, including here uh, in the Western Hemisphere, where democracy was the form of government that was accepted in all sorts of different ways, sort of more or less direct democracy, more or less Republican versions, etc. Um, and then, you know, the Athenians really sort of theorized it in a special way. And of course, Rome helped really uh, establish the Republican way of doing things. But then we do know that in Europe, anyway, democracy kind of faded away for a while. And so one interesting question is, what was the original democracy? And David makes the good point, it was long before Athens. The other interesting point is, how did it come back into vogue? Because today, if you're a modern grown-up nation state, you want to be thought of as a democracy, whether or not you are. How did that happen? And again, we tend to look at Europe and the rise of democracy back, the recovery of democracy, if you want to put it that way, in Europe. But then that raises a question, why? Was it in Europe rather than anywhere else? And so if you look at the world a thousand years ago and you look at sort of the major power centers, you would have picked out the Islamic world and you would have picked out China maybe India, but Europe would not have been in the top two. Europe was a relatively weak, um, low income, low gross domestic product kind of place. And so David makes the argument that interestingly, one of the reasons why democracy sort of re-flourished in Europe is exactly because of its backwardness, because the states that existed in Europe were less good at controlling their populace. The rulers had less information about what was going on, therefore they could tax them less efficiently, the bureaucracy was not as good, and therefore they could punish and control and raise armies less efficiently than in China or uh, the Islamic world. And so in some sense, democracy had a chance of coming back in Europe just because it was fighting against a less powerful autocratic scheme overall. So it's an interesting take, I think. Um, uh, there's, of course, also a give and take between science and philosophy as well as the politics of democracy democracy that is very interesting to think about. And of course, there's no guarantee that democracy stays, right? It, it came for a while, it went away, came again, went away, maybe, who knows? This is what we have to keep an eye out for. There's nothing inevitable about democracy. And, and therefore, it is crucially important, I think, if we want democracy to survive as long as possible, to understand the history of what made it come, what made it go, how to keep it around. So let's go. David Stasavage, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Now, you've written a book about the history of democracy, and we've all been taught a version of the history of democracy, namely that the Greeks invented it, and then the Romans borrowed it, but it kind of collapsed. And over a thousand years later, the Europeans rediscovered it, and now we're spreading it to the whole world. So is that not the correct story? 
Yeah, I don't think that's actually the correct story. It, it's it's a it's a it's a nice story, but it it misses a, a lot of things. And I I think that the, the the traditional story of democracy, as you've just summed it up well, uh, it resembles the idea that democracy was sort of invented at one place and one time, and it, democracy is like a torch that that gets passed on from one society to another. And there's always some core fragility to it. And if the torch ever goes out, then we're done for. And mm. so that describes I- I- exactly the, the what you would have generally learned, or at least what I learned in school with regard to the, the practice being invented by the Greeks, passed on via the Romans, via Italian city-states, maybe thinking about events like Magna Carta in England, on to eventually some more modern type of democracy. And what I tried to argue in, in in the book is not that the the contribution of the Greeks was irrelevant. That would be silly to say. But in fact, what the Greeks did is they gave us the word, the best word to describe democracy, <laughs> democratia, which simply means that the people have power. Yeah. But they didn't invent the practice because there were a lot of human societies independently over the millennia that had systems of governance where the people had power. Well, that's right. Councils via assemblies. Yeah, I mean, and that's the one of the fascinating things. One of the various fascinating things in your book is this idea that democracy was kind of all over the place in one form or the other. In what you label early democracy, it's not exactly what we have now, but you you try to make the case that the idea of the people having some voice and how the society they were in was governed was not at all a rare, precious gem early on. I, I think that's right. And then the key element to distinguish early democracy from the type of democracy we think of today is that if you ask uh, just about anyone today, maybe not just about anyone, if you ask many people today, what is democracy? They would say, well, democracy is about elections, free and fair elections with uh, multiple political parties competing. And we're hopefully also it's possible for incumbents to lose. Yeah. Where incumbents just always don't gain the upper hand. And that that very well describes elements, core our core elements of modern democracy. But that's not the only way that the people can have power. There are a great number of human societies where rulers were not elected. They may have been chosen through some consensual procedure. They may have even inherited their position, but they were constrained to rule together with the people in councils and assemblies because they had really didn't have any other means of governing. So maybe, and so that's what I would call the early democracies. Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, we can put some flesh on those bones with some examples because they are quite variegated. And I won't even suggest. What What are your favorite examples of early democracy? Well, I think my favorite example is is driven a bit by the the, the ethnographic evidence because the Huron, or they called themselves the Wendats, were uh, an Iroquoian speaking tribe in what is today present day. Ontario. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we know an awful lot about their entire society and how they govern themselves, because in the middle of the 17th century, the French crown sent Jesuits out to try to convert these people, obviously. That was the the main goal. But being good Jesuits, they also wanted to learn about these societies in order to achieve that ultimate goal of conversion. And so they sent home something like 72 volumes of reports from this area. And in there, we can find many discussions of how the the Huron actually governed themselves. And it was quite a sophisticated way uh, involving council governance at the level of individual villages and then at each tribe. And then there would be a confederation above the tribal level. And it was one where uh, the formal role of uh, women in politics was not that great, but it was certainly greater than it was in Europe at the time by informal means. So Hmm. that's one of my favorites. And so were these councils literally voted on by, um, I mean, I guess not, white uh, free males, but uh, right. the whatever, whoever the voters were, there was some, was, was there literally like a, a category of voters and they voted for the council and the council made decisions? It would be, it would make decisions and it would make decisions in a very consensual way. And it would make decisions in a consensual way because one of the characteristics of Huron democracy that was true of a lot of early democracies was that um, is a principle I call the take your marbles and go home principle that mm-hmm. anyone who wasn't happy with a decision could always just take off. If an individual tribe did not want to participate in something the Confederation was doing, they could say, we're just not going to do it. Yeah. If an individual village didn't want to dis- uh, participate in something that the tribe was was uh, deciding upon, they could make that, they could do that as well. And so that system uh, meant you really had to have a consensus of some sort to be able to do anything. And was this widespread in the Americas at this time, similar systems, or do we just not know? It was very widespread in the in the Americas. It was certainly widespread uh, among the the Iroquois who called themselves the Haudenosaunee, which means people of the Longhouse. Uh, 
Uh, we have hints of it in a lot of other societies as well, although it wasn't universal among Native American societies pre-conquest. There was a group of societies in the southeastern United States uh, that are referred to as the Mississippian societies that existed at an earlier phase of, of development, and that, they were actually more autocratic in form. Okay. And also um, elsewhere, and you know, where else in the world do we have these early democracies? Well, they were common in a lot of in a lot of different places. So one of the core areas where we have some good evidence comes from pre-colonial Africa, mm -hmm. uh, from uh, what is today the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where people have done remarkable work. Uh, there was a, a historian who died a few years back named Jan Van Sina, uh, who reconstructed a lot of practices of these societies based on contemporary evidence as well as oral tradition. So it's clear that uh, pre-colonial Africa is a, a place where um, early democracy was widespread. It was also widespread in some earlier locales that we wouldn't necessarily think of, like ancient Mesopotamia. Mm. Ancient Mesopotamia, we think of as having been governed by top-down autocrats like Hammurabi of Babylon. But in Mesopotamia, actually, there was a bit of an alternation over time between forms of governance that were more autocratic and forms of governance that were more democratic. And I guess this makes sense. I mean, people like to govern themselves rather than be governed, maybe. Um, can, but can we say anything about how natural or, or you know, common this was overall when a society evolves from just a, a small group of hunter-gatherers or whatever to a, a more organized civilization? Uh, is it 50-50 or is it you know, the rare exception that things go in a democratic direction? I think we can say that it's natural uh, in the sense that this was sufficiently widespread to indicate that it's not a tremendously rare event. The fact that it occurred at very different time periods um, in very different places also. So it's not like the practice was just invented in a couple places and diffused elsewhere. Yeah. So, so it seems to. So that's that's an obvious indication. If you want to get to the actual prediction of how frequent it was or not, well, then we could refer to some of the, the data collected by anthropologists led by George Peter Murdoch back in the, in the 60s and the 70s, where they put together a data set known as a standard cross-cultural sample. And there you could get an indication that early democracy was present maybe in about half of the 186 societies they considered. So, so one out of two, maybe, based yeah, on that. That's very um, interesting that it's exactly a half. Well, not exactly, but you know, near enough to a half. Close enough, close enough. And I think you could try to define it different ways. And that data has all sorts of, of issues with it, not the fault of the authors, but just the fact that it's difficult to decide what is a democracy and what is not a democracy. But it was, it was very prevalent. Do we know much uh, from the Jesuits or anywhere else about what we would now call the political philosophy of these groups? I mean, how explicit were they in saying, you know, people have rights to be represented in their government? They tended not it, it, that there's much less evidence of that. And one always wonders, is that a because Europeans were just uh, unique or exceptional in developing a much more elaborate and formalized system of rights? Uh -huh. Or was it just that when we, we don't have the evidence for this and people were also a, a lot of the, the early ethnographic work that was done was by um, people who didn't necessarily have very. Um, shall we say, enlightened views right. of indigenous peoples, <laughs> and they may have been less interested in that. But I, so there are there are discussions, there are senses of what what a, what the uh, what is um, the what is the way to do things. Uh, certainly, in what we know, coming back to the the Huron and the Iroquois, uh, one thing the Jesuits did remark on is that there are very clear ways of behaving and talking and making arguments mm. in a council or in an assembly that there'd be the speakers would adopt a different tone, very sort of intricate things that we might not think of ourselves, but that I think gets a little bit towards what you're what you're speaking of. So just as, you know, people in the US Senate or House representatives or the or parliament or something like that have formal ways of addressing each other and so forth, that was already there in the Huron assemblies. Yeah, it's very clear that there there was a way to make an argument, and it wasn't just shouting, yeah, uh, or something like that. And there were formal, they're not well. They would be in, to the extent that the if you look at the U.S. Uh, House of Representatives and the Senate, the ways in which arguments have been made from the floor have evolved tremendously over time. Uh, and at any one given time, there tend to be informal norms about this is the the best or most convincing way to make an argument, and this is not. And I think the same was true for the, the Huron or for their 
their neighbors to the south, the Iroquois. You mentioned Mesopotamia as something that kind of went back and forth. I mean, I would guess I wouldn't be surprised if that was pretty common, that there was a, a constant give and take between some people wanted to be autocrats and other people wanted a more democratic rule. Do we have a lot of evidence about regime change or system of government change in these early democracies? Yes, uh, we do. And Mesopotamia is a great example because there was so much <laughs> regime change in that uh, early democracy was a form of government that didn't have to happen only in person, but it was often occurring in a face-to-face -face setting. Right. And so that would be a face-to-face -face setting where the autonomous community or a city perhaps would have uh, a council who, who would we uh, be charged with governing with with uh, with governance affairs, and early democracy would be sustained at that level. But then, what would happen is that eventually someone else would try to say, "I'm going to try to conquer several cities and and make myself yeah. a kingdom or even an empire, if you want to call it that." And then, when these societies, when the form of governance increased in scale, that tended to veer things towards autocracy rather and away from democracy. It's important to take time to do things that lift us up, that make us feel better. One of the best ways I know to do that is learning with The Great Courses Plus. The Great Courses Plus is a streaming service and an app that gets you access to thousands of videos, video lecture courses covering hundreds of topics from credible sources, from professors who know what they're talking about, and also from me. And the number of courses is amazing. You can study things like mindfulness and how to manage stress or deal with anxiety, to make your own pasta from a chef at the Culinary Institute of America. If you want to dig into some of the physics topics we talk about here on Mindscape and want the mathematical background, there's a course by Robert Devaney on Mastering Differential Equations, the Visual Method, just to mention one. So start your journey with The Great Courses Plus today. Your future self will thank you. Sign up with our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Mindscape. When you go there, you'll get a free 14-day trial with unlimited access. So go right now. That's T-H-E, greatcoursesplus com slash Mindscape. And I get the impression from your book that early democracy was, <laughs> I don't know exactly how to put it, more of a full-time job than we have now. You know, it was, uh, there's a lot more direct influence on the people who are voting on the actual decisions the government made. I think that's right. If you were, if you had the right to participate, uh, then you were participating frequently. And certainly if we go to the Athenian example, and we, and we shouldn't forget them, of course, that this has been traced out by people, the actual number of person hours required to uh, govern Athens was rather extraordinary compared to what we <laughs> might think of today, where we're used to voting every couple of years. And for most people in the US or other modern democracies, that's that's the extent of your political participation. But on the other hand, they didn't have email or social media. So they probably had a lot of free time to devote to governing the polis at the time. <laughs> right. Imagine that. And maybe it maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. It's maybe we should get back to that a little bit. <laughs> so about Athens, I mean, was there something special about it? Or is it just that that's where our history sort of focuses back on? Do they they actually innovate when it comes to democracy? I think there were there were uh, there was an innovation in terms of the the first of all the terms they gave us of democracia itself, which uh, and the the principles uh, the equal laws for all. It was innovative in terms of the breadth of participation. Uh, in a lot of early democracies, there would have been wide scale participation, but there wasn't the same principle we have today of every adult should be able to. Mm. Uh, of course, when we say that, we when we say that it was broad participation in Athens, we mean for, first of all, for males, because uh, Athenian women were notoriously excluded yeah. uh, from any political role, really. And of course, there was a significant uh, slave population in Athens as well. Uh, do any of these um, early democracies feature widespread participation by women? Well, yeah, I think some of the, some of the Native American societies come come closest to that from from what we've seen. Uh, I wouldn't say they're the only example, but there mm -hmm. there were some. There were uh, some other early democracy hints of early democratic uh, rule um, around the uh, the north northern parts of the Black Sea, where it's a very interesting story. Actually, uh, we know from Herodotus about the Amazons supposedly, and for a long time, people thought that the Amazons uh, were a myth. But then archaeologists in recent decades have actually started digging up. Uh, yes. These skeletons that are female skeletons would actually see from their bowed legs or other things that they were had been in battle. Mm -hmm. and, and there are myths about those societies having 
having a female rule. Um, I don't we, we don't have a, a record from Jesuits at the time because they weren't around yet of having gone and seen these councils, but it's quite likely that they might have existed. I'm going to betray my incredible um, ignorance about indigenous civilizations in the Americas, but do we have any written records from them about how they organize things in their own words? Well, we have written, we, yeah, we, we, so the, all writing originated from three sources, from cuneiform in Sumeria, from uh, China with, with uh, it, uh, scrapings basically on oracle bones that became Chinese characters. And then with the Olmecs, who were a society in um, uh, two millennia ago in Mesoamerica. Mm -hmm. And it is thought that that was the reason why some societies later in Mesoamerica had a, had a form of writing. So the Aztecs uh, had uh, forms of writing. Other societies between the Olmecs and the Aztecs uh, do what we don't have because a lot of this stuff was destroyed at the time of the of the conquest. Yeah. And, and unfortunately, Cortez was not as interested in the Jesuits <laughs> in learning about these societies and, yeah. and, and writing about them. Um, from the Inca to the south, we have an even more fascinating example. They didn't have writing, but they had this thing called a quipu, which basically looks to, to us today just like a, a group of strings uh, oh, and yeah. of different colors and different lengths. Uh, but we don't know how to interpret those. Now, of course, the, the Aztecs and the Inca were autocratic societies, not democratic. But it would have been interesting if we could know more about what these what these societies thought of themselves. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it just seems like I'm just dwelling on this tremendous historical tragedy that so much of that knowledge was lost. Um, but I guess that's not exactly news to the to, to the world. No, and the you know the other place where you can see some of this is if you go uh, to as I talk about in the book to thinking about governance in pre-Islamic Arabia, then we actually have uh, clear evidence uh, from early parts that that, uh, that wound went, wound up in the Quran about and this thing called the Constitution of Medina about a relatively non-hierarchical form of governance mm -hmm. in localities. And we also can gain inference on that by looking at how Bedouin groups in the Middle East even today govern themselves, and they govern themselves in a very consensual, non-hierarchical way. Mm. Uh, so that's that's another way to get some angle. So you can actually, those are people you can actually go and you can talk to. And I cite, yeah. I didn't go and talk to them myself, but I cite some of them in the book, and it's, it's quite interesting. And we mentioned Athens, and I did a podcast quite a while ago with Edward Watts about the fall of the Roman Republic. And I didn't know much about the Roman Republic. I, I knew a little bit about the empire. But do we give Rome any credit for innovation here in, in the sense that it was less direct democracy, more of a republican system? Was that, you know, an intellectual change or was it just they kind of stumbled upon it? Yeah, that, it, certainly we have to give them credit in two ways. One was that they they were the Romans conquered a lot of peoples and they therefore spread Greek culture and ideas in a lot of different places where it, it, it wouldn't have otherwise been exposed to it uh, throughout uh, yeah. throughout Europe and throughout throughout North Africa as well. But it's also true that the Romans did in, innovate in terms of the way they thought about how a republic should be governed, and they did have a republic for some time. And so there's always been this question among people who think about that your subsequent European developments in the medieval area, they'd like to know, well, where do these where do these practices come from when we start seeing city states and people in places like Florence and Bologna that mm. govern themselves without without kings and uh, might say had at, at times somewhat democratic ways of, of ruling themselves. And there's a debate about whether it comes from the Greeks or the Romans or from some uh, entirely different source. I mean, yeah, you say that it, it, they had it for a while. They had it for 500 years, which is longer than we've had it, right? I mean, I, yeah, uh, that's, no, that's, that's pretty good. And that's <laughs> right, because so far the American Republic has lasted a long, about as long as democracy lasted in Athens. So that's, 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 that's indeed a pretty impressive thing. You're right. There, there is a time scale there, yeah. And I also have the impression, but maybe yours is much more informed than mine, that there were absolutely senses in which the Romans were better at democracy than the Athenians were. I mean, the Athenian democracy was a little bit uh, too unstable because you know everyone could in the in the city could just change their mind and, and call back the fleet at any time rather than the Romans you know picked some representatives to make choices for them. No, I, th I think that's right. And so it was it was a more hierarchical form uh, that provided some stability, but that wasn't a strict and pure hierarchy. And so it was in a more it was a more elaborate. You got this idea. Was not an, it was not a it was not a Roman idea originally, but the idea of quote a mixed constitution, yeah, uh, a constitution having something that would involve 
both a degree of uh, aristocratic influence and a degree of popular influence. And this was something that was a term that existed in the Greek world, but the Romans probably you can think of as establishing that mixed constitution and maintaining it for a long time. And the, the idea of a mixed constitution was, of course, incredibly influential for subsequent right. developments involving the U.S. founding fathers and thinking about how we could should structure our own republic. Okay, so if um, democracy was there half the time, uh, the other half the time there was something else. And I, I guess autocracy is, is the good uh, thing to say that it, it, when you're not democracy, you're autocracy. Is that the other category we should use? Yeah, you could say autocrat or authoritarian, but authoritarian sounds uh, tends to have a much more 20th century ring to it. Um, right. I, I use the, for back, lack of a better term, autocracy in the book because – uh, it describes the, the opposite, but it, in a sense, autocracy itself is a misnomer because, of course, autocrats don't truly govern on their own uh, in almost anything apart from the smallest scale society. An autocrat would need subordinates to govern through. And so it's a autocratic slash bureaucratic order, I would say. Well, that's I think it's a crucially important thing, right? I mean, the strongest centralized dictator relies on the support of a very large number of people, right? At the very least, they're, you know, they're military or they're strong men or whatever. It's not, no one person can do it all by themselves. Precisely. And this is the the way that would-be autocrats got a leg up on things if we come back on things. If we come back to the Mesopotamian example where someone like Hammurabi is trying to conquer uh, several na- neighboring city-states or, or, or kingdom, existing kingdoms, then it helps a lot if you have a standing army. Mm-hmm. that you're paying and you'd get to tell what to do. It helps a lot if you have bureaucrats uh, that can help you go out and collect taxes and assess how much people can and can pay in taxes in the first place. And so all of those aspects that we think of as just natural today didn't always exist. Early democracy existed in lieu of a state bureaucracy. Right. You needed the people to help you rule, whereas autocracy in these early phases was ruling not with the people, but through your own subordinates who you had chosen and remunerated. Do you think that when autocracy did come about, um, it generally replaced some primitive democracy, or are there societies that were just autocratic the whole way down? It's hard to think that it was that it was present from the very, very, very beginning. The, the Chinese case is the one where we have the most continuous historical record of autocracy being the, the 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 paramount, apart from it, a couple very very small periods where China was disintegrating, and there are senses or there are assemblies and cities that were important. Um, but really, you know, from sort of like the the begin mid, middle of the second millennium BC, uh, we have we have autocracy, and it would be it would be fascinating to know what existed before that. But before that, we're we're beyond um, the. Um, knowledge of any existing dynasties and we and we don't have any mm. written records as well okay. so you're just forced to rely purely on archaeological evidence well we should probably talk about the chinese example in some detail i mean um you mentioned bureaucracy a lot i'm surprised how the, much the word bureaucracy comes up in the book but in retrospect it makes perfect sense and in some sense no one is better at the democ- at, at bureaucracy uh, than the chinese system yeah, that's right. I think it, it it's it's very interesting if you if you're someone like me who who started a career in political science in the late 1980s, then at the time the whole idea was China was maybe a deviant path from the more normal political evolution path that the that the, the US and Western Europe were on and as they got richer they would become more democratic and in fact what we've seen I think actually if you look at the history is that China has has presented this continuous alternative political model to our own. And it's a very successful, depending how you judge success, it's a very successful one. Right. By its own standards, uh, it's very successful. That's right. By by its own criteria, it is, it is very successful. And there has been a continuous tradition of having, it, it, you know, in the first two millennia before the, before the common era, you get this gradual development and improvement of bureaucratic tools and also technological tools to make a, a bureaucracy function. And of course, you also needed writing to make a bureaucracy function better mm-hmm. uh, that allowed uh, rulers to to govern in a way that didn't really seek consent from from anyone uh, who was who is who is representing the people or, or not from the people directly either. Uh, and so it's just it's it's, it's it's a fascinating example. Yeah. So, I mean, tell us a little bit more about how democracy came to be in China. I mean, there's famously, you know, examinations uh, that the uh, uh, imperial uh, system would would hand down to let people join the bureaucracy. It just seems 
again, to someone who is completely uneducated in these things, that the existence of a bureaucracy is is much more deeply ingrained in the Chinese way of looking at the world than in the European way. I mean, we, they talk about the celestial bureaucracy, right? Which I don't think that any Western religions ever really emphasized. No, that's right. And there are, uh, you know, it's a very interesting distinction. There are other things like in the, in the Middle East, the idea of the circle of justice, which uh, was uh, something that the, the Islamic conquerors inherited from the Sasanian Empire before them. Uh, and that continued right on until the middle of the, the uh, in 19th century under the Ottomans as a political idea. And in the circle of justice, there is a role for the people, there's a role for the rulers, and there is a rule for, role for tax collectors, <laughs> oddly enough. And so for Europeans, this idea that you know, the tax collector should be a fundamental part of the political order, you know, people in, in, in Renaissance Europe were not, or medieval Europe were not thinking or writing things this yeah. way. That was seen more like they were annoyance. Um, uh, and so it, you're right that the Chinese, the Chinese bureaucratic model is a lot more in, ingrained. And what something like the examination system does is it's almost like an, in, an alternative way uh, of organizing things rather than having a representative assembly, um, mm -hmm. rather than having the people in localities choose representatives and then you're sent and you govern with them. You choose who you're going to have and you choose that based on performance in, exa in an exam, which ideally would make you less beholden to localized interests, which right. could still be a problem even in an autocracy. I mean, you could spin it in a somewhat meritocratic way, right? You know, we're going to send the best people and they're going to rule us. No, and that's right. And so from the point of view of a, uh, you know, comp contrast a, a, um, a English peasant in the 13th century with a Chinese peasant in the 13th century. Well, in England, you would have been maybe excited to hear that there was this new thing called Magna Carta, which was eventually developing into a parliament. But you as a peasant didn't really have much of a say in things individually. Yeah. Uh, whereas in, in China, perhaps maybe someone was happier that actually the, choose this person. I'm not going to rule myself and no one's going to ask me what I want. But maybe at least they're just going to choose the most uh, the most uh, skillful person for doing the job. And that could leave me better off. Was there a Chinese equivalent of the American dream? I mean, could anyone take this exam and join the bureaucracy? Yeah, that's 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 the idea. Uh, there's been, uh, of course, the examination system. Uh, it, it's we talk about it as if it was one constant thing, but of course, it, yeah. it lasted for uh, you know, a very long time, from its beginning in the Tang Dynasty uh, all the way up to its abolition in the you know right around the turn of the 20th century. Um, but yeah, at times that was the idea. Now, of course, like a lot of other examination systems in more recent countries, uh, you observe that people who were um, who had attained the highest rank, uh, their children were also more likely to attain the highest rank. Could be right. for genetic yeah. re genetic reasons, could be for cultural capital or any other mechanism. But it, you're right. At least in principle, there was this idea. It was not something that said like this is exclusively reserved to. Um, to some people and not others. So it's more like the American reality than the American dream. In <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, you mentioned that, uh, actually, before I forget, um, there's a slight deviation, but the system in China, one way or the other, has been around for a very, very long time. Is it is there some sense in which even modern China, which is nominally uh, Communist Party rule, is, is sort of borrowing a lot of the superstructure from that system? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, there's there's I, I don't want to downplay the the innovation of the all the tumult of the 20th century and how the, the PRC is 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 different from from existing or prior um, dynasty imperial dynasties. But there, there is a lot of uh there is a lot of continuity. So in the imperial era, from a very early date, one of the big things that the government does to try to control matters is to have household registration hmm. and to know where people are, what they're doing, and to have people report on each other if there are problems. And this control in that way was something that got set up. And then you see that persisting into the brief Republican period and into the, 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 the system of household registration today, where it's, it seems unlikely that the PRC would have had such an easy time setting up a system of ha household registration yep. if this had not been the practice from, that it was very, very deeply ingrained already. December is a busy month. A lot of people are planning for the holidays. But don't put off planning for the future, such as life insurance. If you want life insurance but don't want to deal with the hassle or expense, try Policy Genius. 
Policy Genius combines a cutting edge insurance marketplace with help from licensed experts to save you time and money. Right now, you can save 50% or more by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance. First, head to policygenius.com. In minutes, you can work out how much coverage you need and compare quotes from top insurers to find the best price. Policy Genius will compare policies starting at as little as a dollar a day. You might even be eligible to skip the in person medical exam. Once you apply, the Policy Genius team will handle all the paperwork and red tape. And the best part is that they work for you, not the insurance company. If you hit any speed bumps during the process, they will take care of everything. So if you have loved ones who depend on your income, don't go into 2021 without life insurance. Go to policygenius.com and get started. You could save 50% or more by comparing quotes and start the new year with one less thing to worry about. Policy Genius. When it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. Well, you mentioned the idea, which you think is a wrong idea, that China is somehow an outlier and uh, it, it's it's the aberration that needs to be explained. It's it, you, you you cast it more as just a very successful alternative, a, a different way of doing things. And it reminded me a little bit of when I read Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. You know, he was kind of a geographic determinist and tried to explain how societies developed on the basis of where they lived and what latitude things stretched out on. But all of his theories were completely falsified by China, and he knew he knew this in some sense. And it was it was very very different. And he sort of tried his best to squeeze it in. Uh, what is it that made China different? I mean, you mentioned that the bureaucracy was there, but then you you have a little bit of uh, more literally down to earth explanation in terms of the form, form of soil and so forth. Yeah, so down to earth, and then I, I try to steer a, 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 a narrow course in the book, or maybe thread the needle is the better metaphor. Um, between, I w- I'd like to emphasize how geography, I think, mattered, how the natural environment mattered. But the problem is, as soon as you start to say that, then people think you're a geographic determinist. Yeah. And I don't, I don't by any means want to say that geography determined for all po- future points in time uh, how a society organized itself. But it is quite dramatic to see the distinction between the European, Western European pattern of extensive agriculture where people are spread out, they're moving, things are a lot more uncertain, makes it harder for rulers to rule uh, with the Chinese pattern where the first few dynasties arose on this uh, plain in, in, in near, near the Yellow River in northeast of China today, where there was a certain type of soil that was very easily farmed, even with uh, easy, uh, with primitive tools, and that allowed for higher yields and a concentration of people and also a certain regularity that you can imagine a bureaucracy would have found it easier to to, to organize. Mm -hmm. And people were not moving around and they weren't practicing a type of agriculture where they needed to move every 20 or 30 years. And so I do think, and we see this in other areas of the world, that type of um, agriculture, that type of uh, system where humans have that relationship with the, the natural environment did lend itself a little bit tilted the scales uh, in in favor of autocracy. Made it easier to rule uh, more or less unilaterally over a large region. I think that's right. I think that's right. Because uh, life was more predictable and visible and uh, legible, to use this this term that a political scientist named James Scott has uh, coined. And just because some listeners might want to might want to Google it, we're talking about Los soil or Lurs soil. How do you how do you yeah, pronounce that's it? That's right. I, I try. I, I, I avoid pronouncing it because <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know exactly how to say it. But yeah, L O E S S. It is a, a German term, and it describes a, a soil that is is deposited um, by. Uh, it's a deposit that that it is very fine grained and so subject to very easy erosion which has always been a problem, but is also very easily farmed. And so yeah. we know that Europe's first farmers were also also existed on these, uh, if a farm, this type of soil. Uh, but in Europe, the low soil was deposited in a lot more small river valleys uh, and uh, in, in locations that were spread out. There was no one large low plain of the type that we that we see in China. And the other example that one has to confront of a non-democratic rule, but in a you know relatively successful society overall, is the Middle East. You know the Islamic uh, nations, the caliphates, um, and and that there the explanation for autocracy is maybe a little bit different, but but not incompatible with the Chinese explanation. No, that's right. It's not incompatible, but I, I, it's fascinating because I think it, it, uh, it, it it's different than what a lot of people think. It, it was due to the nature of the Islamic conquest that we got a shift to autocracy, but it had nothing to do with Islam as a religion itself. 
Uh, what happened was uh, when the, the Arab armies uh, spread out of Arabia, one of the first places they conquer is uh, uh, the Sassanid Empire that I referred to earlier, which was located in where present day Iraq is, southern Iraq. And this was an area that had a very fertile soil where there was an intensive system of agriculture based on ir- ir- irrigation and where the Sasanian rulers over time had built up a very nice autocratic bureaucratic system for themselves where they were taxing people based. They knew how much they could produce. They would ta- give you a different tax rate to paint on, on the quality of your soil or what kind of crops you were growing. And so what that did is it allowed inheriting a state, inheriting a bureaucratic state allowed the Islamic conquerors to shift over to a more autocratic form of rule. Mm. And so there are, while these traditions say that the first few caliphs were chosen through shura, which is a principle of consensus and consultation, after a first after um, a, a, a brief amount of period of time, all that goes out the window and we have a system of inheritance and autocracy for rule. Right. So basically, the you know, the tools were in place for them to uh, quickly moved in autocratic direction. Yeah, exactly. Just because they were lucky to inherit that from someone else. And so what they did is they got rid of the Sasanian rulers, but otherwise they kept the the rest of the state. And it was very convenient. And it was a huge source of revenue that allowed them to go out and conquer other territories as well. And not to wildly generalize, generalize we're going to move back to Europe in a second. But what about places like India, Japan, Southeast Asia? Are, are there Were they autocratic, democratic, somewhere in between? So, so India is interesting in that I, 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 I don't want to go too much out on a limb, but it, it's interesting that we do have these examples from ancient India uh, that I, I talk about in chapter two of the book about uh, examples of ancient Indian republics. The, mm-hmm. the, the evidence is, is not terrific. It's not as detailed as what we have for the Huron, but it's, it's extensive enough to suggest that, yes, there were actually republics that existed in India at that time. Now, I don't want to suggest that because India had... Um, republics in the time of Buddha, that it's necessarily a democracy today. Uh, but w- but that, that would probably be a little bit of a yeah. of a leap. Um, but it's interesting to see that all the same, uh, in, there was never a period where uh, autocratic, bureaucratic rules succeeded in uniting all of India in a very, very durable way. Right. Uh, and I, I think that, that, that does matter for the political trajectory. There was some democratic energy there somewhere, even if only in pockets. Yes. Yes. When you compare it to the Chinese case, I think this, the, the difference is really stark. OK. And so now uh, with all of that wonderful, now that we know the complete history of early democracy, thank you very much. <laughs> that was quick, but very useful. Sure. Um, <laughs> but now it gets into the part which I really think is fascinating and, and difficult to grapple with, which is the, the implication that in some sense, what made democracy fail was the places where government was effective. Uh, in other words, where, whether the technology and the societal structures uh, were able to give the governments the power to do what they wanted. And, you know, you didn't need democracy in those cases or, or democracy couldn't evolve in some sense. Um, is, that a, is that a roughly good lesson to draw? Yeah, I think that's that's one of the lessons that I've drawn myself and that I'm trying to convince others of. But it, it's we have a tendency to think of based on the world that we've had until recently, well, if you go back several decades where we still used to talk about, quote, the advanced industrialized democracies, we're no longer so advanced nor (laughs) so democratic. Uh, But thinking that whatever generated democracy and whatever generated progress must have gone hand in hand, the sort of all good things go together approach. And uh, what we actually see is that Europeans, if you're if you're if you're in favor of democracy, which I am, then you have to believe, based on the evidence, that our democratic inheritance from Europe is due in large part, or at least in significant part, to the fact that Europe was behind technologically yeah. in a lot of different ways in terms of building states, and that people tend to not realize that strong state bureaucracies in Europe are a 19th and 20th century phenomenon, whereas in other parts of the globe. They existed at a much earlier date, and that's a that that was the mind blowing radical claim that I got from your book exactly uh, that that somehow, I mean, in retrospect, it's clear you know um, fifteen hundred years ago, uh, maybe arguably two thousand years ago, China was ahead of Europe um, technologically, and and a thousand years ago, the uh, Middle East certainly was ahead, um, but and and, and we. Like you say, we we like to 
give some credit to technology and, and democracy going hand in hand, but we kind of get the opposite lesson here. Yeah, that's right. And uh, so now I don't want to suggest by that that all new technology is bad and that we need to flee from it. Uh, but you can think then about different types of technologies and how technology, what types of technologies gave access to the state uh, uh, bureaucracy and which types of technologies gave access to ordinary people. And so if you think of writing as being a fundamental technology for human society, then there are different forms of writing. Some forms of writing, pre-alphabetic forms of writing or non-alphabetic forms of writing are much more complicated to learn. Uh, if you go back to ancient Sumeria, cuneiform was something that would have been learned only by a state elite mm -hmm. or linear B and A in, in Greece uh, during the Bronze Age. Same deal. But if you get to alphabetic forms of writing, then that's a technology that provides much more, much broader access mm. to anyone who can learn it. So we could say at the end that technology has had this effect. But then if you wanted to push further, uh, and I, I touched on this very slightly in, 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 in chapter four, but could take it further to suggest that then what you need to be discussing is what when is it the technology is developing, but it provides broad access to people in society? And when is it a technology that is especially reinforcing the right. power of the state bureaucracy? But the other thing that has great resonance with our current situation is that one of the things you can do with technology is surveillance or, you know, understanding what's going on in your country. And that that if you can surveil and you know what's going on, you can take uh, you can collect taxes and that could make your mm -hmm. government stronger. No, exactly. And so the, the, the surveillance capacity of a modern state is absolutely extraordinary and would have made any any ancient autocrat who had surveillance technology for knowing what people could grow or how much they should be taxed <laughs> would have loved modern modern state surveillance in that way. Uh, and of course, some some governments around the globe are are really going in, in, in that direction. Um, well, you, know, you the have other, these, you, yeah, you sorry, have these wonderful graphs uh, that, that display very vividly in the book that where tax collection was good, autocracy followed. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. And so, well, the two went, the two went hand in hand that, that, that the autocrats were much more, had much higher levels of revenue per, yeah. per, per size of the economy. Uh, and, and it's really, the differences are really extraordinary. That's right. So is it is it too crazy to say something like or too simplistic to say something like the following that uh, there was more or less advanced technology and social structure in China and uh, the Middle East that enabled autocratic governments to stay in power and and you know stave off any democratic impulses whereas in Europe where the technology was not as good uh, local sets of people could demand their rights and become more democratic. But then what I want to say is, you know, there was at some point a sympathy between the democratic impulse and the scientific impulse, right? I mean, letting people come up with crazy ideas and explore them and falsify them and so forth seems to be a common philosophical attitude that, that is both in democracy and in science. No, I think that's absolutely right, and 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 that that gets into a very that gets into a very big debate um, that was inspired. Some people refer to it as the Needham question from uh, the 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 great China scholar Joseph Needham about why, if China was is, was developed all these techniques and technologies earlier, far earlier than Europeans did, why is it that eventually uh, Europe in, in ended up being the first to industrialize and the first modern scientific society? Uh, right. So what what I, what that's that's probably what you could say is that by the very nature of democracy, earlier modern being a somewhat more disorganized and decentralized affair than autocracy, mm -hmm. it gave people the the margin to experiment and to think about what they would what they would like to 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 to, to do on their own. Um, so you know, one person I, I think it's a little bit too trite to say it this way, but someone has suggested that well, if Galileo had lived in China, he would have been a state bureaucrat. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. Well, maybe yeah. that's not trite. I don't know, but maybe I'm just being trite myself. It's a, it's but... a little bit trite because I think there were a lot of technological innovations in the bureaucracy in China, and right. you know, the Chinese bureaucracy was quite uh, amazing in terms of what it could be, be could do. But I think there's something to that. There's something to that, 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 that underlying idea that you raised. Well, could we put it this way? I mean, um, people like Galileo and Bruno and Copernicus and Kepler, uh, raised a fuss and the institutions did try in some sense to stop them, but failed maybe because, 
because those institutions were weaker than they would have been in a in a very flourishing autocracy. Well, that's the other thing. Exactly. It's not just that the it's a question of what were the alternatives to do? What were the, the nature of European society at its time, uh, at the time of I mean, we wouldn't. Bruno obviously he got burnt at the stake, so that, that was that was a that's a fairly <laughs> that's, that's an example of power, right? But <laughs> yes, there uh, th- there were uh, the idea that someone like Copernicus could have this have this uh, have this. Uh, I don't know if you call it a treaty. Is we're getting more into your area the, of knowledge <laughs> than me. Um, and he didn't publish it until after he died. Is yeah, that correct? That's correct. That is yeah. Okay, but the idea that that would be out. And um, he, he could do that on his own with no one watching and have it published even afterwards is pretty extraordinary. Right. Yeah. So um, it, it speaks to this this point that you emphasize quite a bit, which is the path dependence of how these things happen, that rather than seeing it as just progression from autocratic rule to democracy, um, there's a back and forth that is kind of unpredictable, you know, like what kind of technologies and what kind of social structures come first uh, affect greatly what will come afterward. Yeah, there's a there's a back and forth. And there's especially an issue of sequencing. Um, that's, I guess that's a term that political scientists used to lo- love to use. So I use it. But, uh, when I wrote the first draft of this book, some people thought, oh, wow, this sounds like a real libertarian take. Like if we had no bureaucracy, then we'd be yeah. more likely to be democratic. <laughs> and I, that's probably true, right? That, but that wouldn't necessarily be that great a thing because bureaucracies do a lot of great things for us. So what I emphasize is this sequencing question. If you have an early democratic tradition, and you develop that for a society that's maybe on a larger scale than something like a village or a city, as Europeans did, then eventually you can develop a state bureaucracy. And it's a state bureaucracy that is controlled by representatives of the people and the ruler uh, himself or herself as well. And so you get to a more virtuous outcome than if you start with bureaucratic rule right. uh, as being the first step. Yeah. So, I mean, let's go, let's revisit uh, Europe when the democracy began coming back. And, and you attribute a lot of it if to oversimplify once again, just to the fact that the rulers were so weak, right? I mean, there were kings, there were emperors, but there was a lot of local autonomy and a lot of the energy for democracy came from there. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I think uh, someone said uh, that one way to sum it up in my book is if follow, to understand democracy, follow the money, which again, <laughs> maybe a little bit too trite, but it, it, it's one way of saying it. And so what, what happened is that both Europe and China experienced um, commercial revolutions uh, at roughly the same time, um, and and around you know in China a little bit earlier in terms of around the turn of the first millennium, and Europe a couple hundred years after that, um, thought perhaps to have been linked to somehow favorable solar activity. Mm. And in China, we have a lot of commercial development; cities grow in size, but you already have a state bureaucracy, and so they just say, "Oh, this is great; we're going to tax this economic activity." Yeah. In Europe, you get the growth of towns and cities, but these are all autonomous because rulers have no bureaucracy. They have no real central power. And so now rulers recognize, wow, these towns are rich. They're growing rich. They're engaging in commerce. We like to go to war with people next door. How am I going to raise money? Well, I'm going to have to talk to the towns and the cities, but I have no way of forcing the towns and the cities to, to give me something. And I have no bureaucracy to collect it. So you're forced to go into this more consensual way of governing where you have an assembly and you have a representative mm. assembly uh, or a representative from the town be part of the assembly. And then you have a bargaining uh, interaction about how much can be paid in terms of taxes. And so that's that's where that's how it gets rolling. And were the towns themselves democratic? Is there a sense in which dem- democracy sort of starts on the smaller, le- legit- literally smaller scales and then expands upward? It varied a lot. Uh, it, it, it the the general view from medieval historians is it, 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 a sort of stereotypical or, or archetypal view is that a lot of the towns started off um, when they first became autonomous as quite uh, quite uh, non hierarchical, mm-hmm. and then gradually over time they got more hierarchical as you would get a smaller oligarchy of people uh, running the town council. So it really depended on what was the breadth of participation in the town council. There's considerable variation. Sometimes it would be just the merchants' guild, the richest people in the town. Sometimes it would also be members of artisans' guilds as well. So right. in any case, what's interesting about the cities is they were not ruled as autocracies. We, it's, it's fascinating to think about. We, have, we don't have a great list of really memorable names of rulers of Republican autonomous cities in Europe because the individual rulers weren't that important. It was oh, more of a collective yeah. operation. 
And where in where should we give credit to the revival of uh, democracy in Europe? Are there are there specific places that uh, are most notable there? Well, it's especially uh, if you want to think about the urban phenomenon, it's especially something that occurs in northern Italy, uh, in parts of Catalonia, and in the Low Countries, especially also that are really that are really uh, the first movers in terms of the representative assembly phenomenon and where you get new ideas about what it means to have political representation and what the rights and responsibilities of, of different groups are. And was it mostly economics uh, and sort of the organization of trade that made that happen? Or were there, you know, were they reading um, Aristotle once again and got all fired up? <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, there's, it, it's hard to deny that the, the, the rediscovery of the classical tradition fed into this, but it fed into it that, that, that you know, Aristotle wasn't retranslated into, into um, Latin until about 1260. And that's about 100 years after a lot of the towns in hmm. uh, northern Italy became autonomous. So the fascinating thing about this representative phenomenon and the autonomous city phenomenon is it started off with ordinary people basically rebuilding the ship at sea. Uh, they, huh. they needed to figure out a different way of governing, and they didn't have some core constitutional or classical text to rely on to say, oh, we just do it like it says in the book. And one of the, thing, one of the things I think to Americans that is most interesting is, or, or most surprising, I guess, is that we, our myth is that we were ruled by a king and we threw him over and we invented democracy. But uh, a lot of this resurgence of democracy was much more gradual and negotiated, right? I mean, there were kings, but they gave up their power, maybe not willingly, but because they were negotiating with some councils or some nobles or something like that. No, that's right. It was it was negotiated and evolved over time, and it was very widespread within Europe. Uh, it wasn't a specifically Anglo-American, Anglo and then American phenomenon. But England did play a big role, right? I mean, do you think that England uh, was one of the first to really get the democratic ball rolling in, in uh, with its most momentum? Yeah, I think so. And if you want to talk about England now, I think it is, I don't know if it's too early, but we could talk about the shift to modern yeah. democracy because that's what's really critical for for. So the English, uh, there's this old phrase from the 19th century that the English Parliament was the mother of all parliaments, mm -hmm. and and that is completely incorrect because we know that assemblies and parliament they were called different things in different places, but uh, assemblies like this existed in, in in a great many European states around the, in the medieval and early modern eras. What was different about England was a new type of, it was a mother of a new type of parliament. And, and, and there are several ways in which this was the case. The, perhaps the most important was that in England from the 14th century, middle of the 14th century onwards, representatives could no longer be bound by mandates given by their constituencies. So right. elsewhere in Europe, it had been and continue, would continue to be the practice much more frequently for a town to say, okay, we are sending you as a representative to this assembly, and this is what you can agree to, and this is not what you and what you cannot agree to, and that was it. Uh, <laughs> and that was obviously meant as as a way of trying to prevent representatives for, for being um, uh, subject to undue royal influence. But as you can imagine, it, it led to a very cumbersome means of decision making because if all you could agree to is that, then then how it, everybody would have to go back to their constituencies and come back again and so on and iterate. Yeah. Uh, it, it made things very clumsy. It was good for liberty. Uh, good for early democracy, but it was also very clumsy. In Britain, for one reason or another, and it's a, I don't know if we know exactly why this was the case, the crown succeeds in imposing from the middle of the 14th century onwards uh, this idea that members must come with full powers. This hmm. is a, it's an expression that existed in, uh, in other uh, European countries as well, but it was really implemented in, in England and full powers, meaning that you could no longer have a mandate from your constituency and you could not, be able, you could not say, okay, I can't finish and decide what I feel about this proposal until I go back and talk to my constituency again. And so that made suddenly the British Parliament a much more decisive type of organization, in a way perhaps also a little bit less democratic. How does that relate to what it would have been in the Roman Republic? Um, in the Roman Republic, uh, to, there, were, there would not have been uh, mandates as well, but there would also been the, the Roman system is a little bit different in terms of the extent to rely on uh, the decentralized forms of revenue collection. So it's a, it's a little bit of a diffi difficult comparison. I think the, the better comparison is with the Dutch Republic. Okay. 
Um, the Dutch Republic, Dutch, uh, the Dutch Republic is fascinating because the, 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 the Dutch Republic is often called the first modern economy. So it really was the richest society on earth in the 17th century. Yet they had this very pre-modern form of representation where mandates continued as a means of uh, binding representatives right up until the 18th century, huh. uh, until the end of the 18th century. And the Dutch, just like the Iroquois and the uh, Huron before them, had a, a it, what is in its essence a model of political representation where you could still take your marbles and go home if you weren't happy. <laughs> uh, and so there are these stories where they were trying to organize and figure out how we're going to pay for ships to for naval engagements against England. And, and, and sometimes they just couldn't get the money because an individual city would say, well, sorry, I'm not paying this time. Right. I mean, it seems like uh, even if there's not geographic determinism here, there's an awful lot of economic determinism that what really enabled this sort of devolution of power from the autocrat to smaller uh, collections of people was that those people had the money. That's right. Those people had the money, but also conditional on there not being a prior bureaucratic order. Because if they uh, were, then they could collect taxes and the autocrat would get all the money. Exactly. So that's why the Chinese commercial re revolution under the Song dynasty did not lead to uh, the, the dismantling of the, uh, of the imperial state. Uh, and in fact, reinforced it. But you're right. In a context where the, the, the ruler starts off weak to begin with, the, the growth of, of the, 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 the civil society in that way of their economic power um, leads to a strengthening of democracy. That's because basically for the fundamental reason that rulers really started to need their people. Yeah. I, I mean, I have, okay, I have a bunch of like miscellaneous questions. You can tell me where they fit in here. Um, even before this renaissance of democracy in Europe, uh, the church played an enormous role, right, in, in the life of the continent. And is there some sense in which the church was democratic? I mean, you vote for the Pope, at least the, the Council of Cardinals, College of Cardinals votes for the Pope. Yeah, so the, the the Pope actually suffered the same problem as did European monarchs, and the, the Pope didn't really have much of a bureaucracy, and had, was uh, okay. The Pope technically doesn't rule, but uh, yeah. if we if we, if you permit the term, the Pope had to manage things uh, with a very decentralized system of different abbeys and monasteries and chapters and orders and so on. Um, and the Pope, like a lot of other rulers, uh, sometimes felt like they wanted to get money. Yeah. And they wanted to get money maybe for a new crusade or something like that. And so, well, what they wanted to do that, they didn't have a bureaucracy to just say, OK, you must all pay this. The tithe, to the extent existed, was a local tax. Um, so what the, the, the what ends up happening is from a very early date in the early 13th century, that the, the papacy and the church becomes actually something of an incubator for a lot of these democratic um ideas. This 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 Latin phrase, uh, quad omnis tangit, that goes on a little bit longer that says, Basically, that which touches all should be um, discussed and approved by all um, comes by a tacit agreement between the papacy and various other uh, church bodies saying, OK, if we're going to give you money, then we should have a role in agreeing, like, should there be a new crusade um, uh, against the Albigensians or against other groups <laughs> or something like that? Right. OK. But I mean, I, I was just thinking more of the role model aspect. I mean, uh, w was it always oh. true that the pope was elected by the cardinals? Yeah, no, the pope was elected. That's right. Uh, but I don't know that I, I don't know if that really served as the main the main instigator for because certainly what you don't find is it, it, when elections for, for uh, nation, nation states come in later on, um, it's often in places where people have anti-clerical attitudes. So yeah, okay. France, for example, <laughs> people weren't saying at the time of the French Revolution, oh boy, well, the popes have been elected forever, so why don't we do it that way here? I guess the pope was elected, but it was supposed to be uh, the will of God who was moving people's hands and in, in doing it. So maybe not a good yeah. role model. <laughs> yeah, no, not that. I mean, a great example if you think about it, but for various reasons, I don't think that I don't think people wanted to go there. And the other kind of sort of miscellaneous question I didn't want to forget was... Um, when we compare China, and, and maybe this also works for the Middle East, to Europe, one of the differences, besides the fact that there were stronger uh, bureaucracies in China and the Middle East, uh, there's this uh, Tower of Babel kind of um, situation in Europe where people didn't share a common language and they were sort of very fractured. And is it too much or too little to say that that kind of differentiation between European cultures 
provided some energy also that led to innovation uh, and, and led to Europe actually sort of through the force of competition taking over the world? Yes, I, I, I think it, that that's been an argument that has been around for, for some time. And there have been a couple great books on that subject recently that provided more evidence. Uh, Phil Hoffman's uh, Why Did Europeans Conquer the World is excellent at showing that Europeans may have been may not have been ahead of other societies in terms of most economic technologies, but it was interstate competition that drove this remarkable progress in terms of firearms technology yeah. uh, in, in Europe <laughs> during the early. And if you look at the the rates, uh, the 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 rate of um, annual rates of technology, if you uh, growth in the in firearms based on basically how long it took. Uh, uh, an individual musketeer to fire how many rounds, you get an astounding rate of technological progress. It's sort of more like what we're used to seeing in industrial societies in, yeah. and that are really growing quickly and certainly not something that you're used to seeing in a, in a pre-industrial society. Got it. Okay, very good. Um, the, and then back to the sort of the, the history of the, of the democracy coming up. Um, even if... The, these first resurgence of democracy uh, came before we had rediscovered Aristotle. It certainly seems like there was theorizing about democracy that flourished uh, in Europe around around this time. Was is there what is the chicken egg and egg effect here? Was there a lot of effect of uh, thoughts about the rights of people uh, that fed into people saying, "Okay, yes, I suppose we could become democratic," or was it more ex post facto justification? Uh, so coming back to the medieval and early modern eras, then I, I, I think I, 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 this is another thing I try to steer a fine line in the book between saying, on one hand, I, I don't believe and I don't think the evidence is there to support the view that it's just sort of these ideas were discovered by someone or handed down from on high or rediscovering the classical tradition that led people to behave and suddenly say, well, we'd, we'd like to move towards democracy. Um, I think there were a lot more structural features that we just talked about that led towards that that development of a more democratic form of rule in Europe. But, but sorry, I, I was actually the, thinking more like the Enlightenment, more like, you know, yeah, once we get to Locke yeah. and Hobbes and so forth. Yeah, certainly what was very crucial before Locke and Hobbes, before all that, Europeans developed these theories of political representation and theories of a state and what that was. Uh, and I think those were absolutely critical to subsequent democratic development and also critical for the 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 uh, the idea of liberty itself, and I think the idea of liberty mm. itself is something that could exist first of all because you weren't in an autocratic bureaucratic order where if you wrote about liberty, you would have been censored or your book wouldn't have been allowed. Uh, but then, actually, of course, the ideas mattered to the extent they had some traction to the extent that someone had to come up with a particularly elegant and compact and incisive way of expressing these ideas. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, it's a natural thought for us here in the U.S. because we tell ourselves that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were heavily influenced by some of these uh, more philosophical writings at the time. Yes, I think that's right. Uh, and at the same time that they were also trying to solve a very practical from their minds set of a set of questions. Yeah. And is it... Does, how well does the U.S. fit into your general framework? It seems to fit in pretty well. I mean, can we say that... There was no pre-existing bureaucratic state in the in the Brit British colonies, and therefore it was relatively easy for democracy to take hold. Yeah, I think that's that that's true. And that what happens if you if you think coming back to the 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 the, the natural environment, you have a uh, a a situation of tremendous land abundance. Uh, after European conquest, and that is uh, even in, in Native American populations were actually. Um, much less there was uh, the, there was lower population density compared to the population density in Mesoamerica, mm -hmm. and then of course uh, in, a lot of the native uh, huge amounts of the native population were either exterminated or died off from European diseases. So uh, what you get then is this through this horrible sequence of events, you get this uh, area of great land abundance where British settlers are coming over, or people are trying to attract British settlers. And things are going relatively well in the 17th century in, in England in terms of rate, wages are rising for ordinary people. And so in that environment, it, you, you have these people you're trying to attract to come over. The people who are running the colonies switched over to saying, OK, you can have the vote. Maybe if you're able to vote about your affairs, you'll come over. And also there was a great break on things of saying that people could just sort of take off into the woods and found their new settlement yeah. if they weren't happy with someone who tried to rule 
in an autocratic fashion. Um, and so I think that was it was tremendously important. This was, a, 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 to be fair, that you make this point very clearly that not only um, does a functioning bureaucracy help autocracy, but the ability to vote with your feet and to get up and leave is a, is a big boon to democracy. That's right. Now, the distinction being, of course, that this was a story of what was happening for free white males, whereas for Africans sure. who were brought over, the story was the absolute <laughs> flip side uh, in terms of they were being brought over forcibly to try to solve a problem of land abundance and labor scarcity, but they didn't have the same exit options right. that an ordinary British settler would have had. Yeah, and didn't get the right to vote. So, yeah, that, that makes perfect yeah. sense. Exactly. So it's the same feature of land abundance that uh, it leads to liberty for some and to slavery for others. Right. Is there any chance that some of the early settlers in the Americas were influenced in their thinking by the Native American way of doing things, even if there's terrible stories of, you know, war and pestilence, but could there have been some uh, philosophical influence there? That, it, that has been a huge debate over time, and it's often been a debate where people have very strong views and we don't have a tremendous <laughs> amount of evidence. So okay. what we certainly know is that it, there are a great many cases where uh, Europeans who came over had a, a respect for some Europeans who came over, had a respect for Native American institutions. And so there's always this debate about, well, the Iroquois Confederacy was quite an amazing example of democracy. Mm -hmm. Did this influence people like Ben Franklin, who then helps help, helped influence uh, the Constitution? And that's there's a there's been a huge debate over that all the time, sort of attempting to show it that yes, this had this influence. That's right. that's a difficult that's a difficult task. It was certainly the case though that these institutions were that the Native Americans had were appreciated, and uh, coming back to the Huron again, the the Jesuits said, well, their 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 Confederation Council is like the Estates General, which was the representative assembly in France. Mm. So, so it's not implausible to say that there was a connection. It's just to, to show it, to show that it really made the difference. Uh, uh, these ideas percolating through is, 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 is a difficult task. Well, and I can certainly imagine that they did have an influence, but that no one mentioned it, right? That it was not the way you said it. It was much more prestigious to hearken back to uh, Athens than to give credit to the Iroquois. Uh, that is also certainly true. That would not have gotten <laughs> bought you miss prestige with a lot of people to say this is the, this is what we're modeling this on. So if in England, one of the great innovations was basically to elect representatives and then let them make their decisions rather than to give them explicit instructions through mandates, um, were there extra innovations when we got to the U.S. and the Constitution? Well, the, the, the other innovations have to do with, uh, in many senses, pushing uh, – there's a distinction between what happens under the colonies and what happens under the Constitution. In the colonies – at times, a lot of the colonial assemblies, uh, particularly in New England, um, tended to bring back some earlier forms of democracy. Mandates were sometimes used, the principle that, that a representative could be impeached. Mm -hmm. there, and the frequency of elections was was very high. So you tended to reelect people, have, an, have a choice to reelect people every year ah. in a lot of in instances. Uh, and so that is much different from the British example. But then what happens with the Constitution is the Constitution sort of sweeps a lot of those things out. So there is no possibility of mandates. So that gets debated, actually. It was debated whether uh, in the debates over what would become the First Amendment, some people suggested that freedom to expression might mean freedom to express a view that would constrain your representative. Uh -huh. um, and elections become less frequent uh, and and. And so there was a shift away towards a somewhat more distant view where citizens only were able to express their views every few years uh, instead of every year. And in some sense, these are moves slightly away from the purest form of democracy, right? But maybe towards something more sustainable and, and stable. Well, that's the question, right? Because a lot of the founders, certainly what they didn't want, they had this view that actual more direct democracy would be this cantankerous thing that wouldn't uh, wouldn't fly. And also they tended to be richer than most people. And so they were probably yeah. worried about uh, being expropriated. There's a lot of movement in the 1780s about people who only owned debts, who wanted debts to be canceled. A lot of this uh, fed into debates about the, the Constitution. And so whether you want to see it as sort of... Um, narrow, cynically minded or broad minded in terms of stability, the end out, uh, outcome ends up being the same. 
that we have a much more distant type of democracy than we otherwise would have had. Yeah. And is it is there is it possible to measure the extent to which uh, this experiment that happened in the United States with the Constitution really did influence thinking back over in Europe? Uh, I think it 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 certainly if if you if you come back to thinking about of course the the big one the French Revolution mm-hmm. uh, and others then you you start to get uh, movements that resemble uh, or ideas transmitting that resemble what you saw in the U S so it's certainly there's a debate about mandates and whether they should be allowed uh, during the French Revolution and the decision is very clear and very stark that no a you know a modern republic. Uh, or democracy, whatever you want to call it, uh, representatives should not be bound by mandates. Right. Okay. A longer elector, longer electoral terms as well were another feature. And I guess you know we already talked about the fraught relationship between uh, democracy and technology or science. That in some sense, good technology uh, enables you to stop democracy from growing. But then once democracy is there, it enables even better scientific progress. What about the analogous question vis-a-vis uh, economic development or inequality? I think that there's a story we would like to tell ourselves that democracies are engines of economic success as well. Is that a legit claim or are we just uh, telling stories to ourselves? Yeah, and it, there, is, there are legit claims, but that is something that has been debated over and over. And the data... I think may point to uh, a slight a- 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 advance for democracies in that regard, but it- it's tough to tell because, of course, European Europe was the cradle of modern democracy, but for a very, very long time, it was very backward economically compared to other world regions. So that would seem to yeah. call into question that. If there is a- 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 an added benefit of democracy, uh, several people have suggested something along the lines of what you already hinted at, and I think this would be how the argument would have to be made, is to say that it's precisely because the democratic spirit goes hand in hand with this uh, spirit of free inquiry right. into uh, affairs, both scientific and other, that if you see that scientific uh, progress is fundamental to economic progress, as it most certainly is, uh, then, then you could make an argument. It's just that's an, it's an easier argument to say than to actually prove it. Um, <laughs> but, but, uh, but it's certainly out there as an idea. Okay, so I, I I would have skipped ahead a couple hundred years to just bring up bring us up to today. Um, thinking about the status of democracy today, and I guess that there's two sides to that. One is there are still plenty of countries out there that are not democratic. What are the prospects for them? And on the other side. There are countries that are democratic where democracy is under threat a little bit. I mean, I worry that the lesson of your book is since a very strong bureaucracy and knowledgeable surveillance state uh, is a good tool to stave off democracy, then we're in trouble because that's everywhere now. Yeah, that's right. And the power of the modern state is really remarkable uh, in many cases. So I think that comes back to the 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 idea that something developments like that are not necessarily a bad thing for democracy i hope if i'm right and i hope mm-hmm. i'm right if you have this long democratic tradition and pattern of governance beforehand so if you have a country like the us if we continue to keep ourselves a democracy where if there's some development in surveillance technology that could be used to monitor people and to know what they're doing that it's possible for ruler and people people indirectly via their representatives to discuss what sort of limit should be placed on the use of that technology. Uh, But for autocratic societies, you would think, yes, this unambiguously strengthens the power of the, of the, of the, of the central state. Well, presumably it enables uh, people who are pro-democracy to sort of organize and share information in a different way. Uh, That, that must countervail a little bit against the ability of the state to see what we're doing. Yeah, and, and, and the, the literature on that has kind of gone back and forth. When Twitter first came out, uh, uh, there there was a lot of discussion about, well, how people in protesting in places like Ukraine were using Twitter to coordinate. Yeah. Uh, and they could certainly do that. But then what you see afterwards, uh, after the with the, 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 lack of, uh, the lack of effect of the Arab Spring and in yeah. turning the Middle East toward on a, uh, on a more democratic trajectory – is that states also learn to use these new tools very effectively as well. Right. Uh, and so I, I think the jury's out for things like that. I think the jury's out 
Uh, sometimes it must be helpful for democracy sometimes. And we simply, we, these are very, very, re- in, the, in the scope of human history, these are extremely recent developments. Sure. So I, I think we should be, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, it's very hard with that little, that, 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 you know, that amount of data and that l- minimal amount of experience to sort of predict which way it's going to go. Right. We should certainly be appropriately humble. But, and, and I think that, that it flows both ways. I mean, part of us, Part of the lesson is uh, if we look at a place like China, there's no inevitability that it's going to turn into a democracy someday, right? I mean, given its history and the strength of its current state and its empirical success in squelching things like the memory of the Tiananmen Square event and so forth, it's completely plausible that it'll just uh, have this kind of autocratic rule into the foreseeable future. No, I think that's absolutely correct. And so the view that would have been common circa 1989 would have been uh, either China would not be, can be able to continue to develop economically unless it became more democratic, or that as China grew richer, people would demand democracy, democracy of a sort um, we have, uh, has not come, 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 has not, it definitely not come to pass yet. And so if uh, from people who were making that ar- argument in 1989, if you told them how rich China would be in 2020, yeah, and it would still be very much an autocracy. I uh, think they would have recognized that they got the argument wrong. But on the other side, I can imagine that the world is increasingly interconnected, and something that is true now that would not have been relevant 2,000 years ago is that people in China cannot help but know that there are other countries out there that are democracies. I mean, surely that has some effect, giving them a little bit of hope. Uh, I mean, maybe I'm whistling in the dark here. Yeah, it's led to this interesting fact that since 1945, um, most everyone has said that they're a democracy. Yeah. Uh, you know, North Korea, <laughs> democratic, <laughs> supposedly. Yeah. Uh, Mao, Mao emphasized the idea of a people's democracy, mm-hmm. which he contrasted with bourgeois liberal democracy. And so the Chinese have their own word for for, for, for her democracy, Minju, and they speak of democracy of a different, very, very different sort. Uh, within China, as opposed to um, as opposed to liberal democracy elsewhere, and so it's almost like you, you, you no one, no one is running around saying praising the virtues of autocracy. In the modern yeah. world, you've got to claim that you're truly democratic. And yet, we do have um, a rise of populism and related movements. I mean, how worried are you about the stability of democracies in Europe and, and the U.S. And, and the West more generally? I, I think it's quite worrisome. I, I think the the I, I, I sort of say the immediate developments are very worrisome. Um, but we also need to keep things in broader perspective. So, mm-hmm. circa nineteen hundred, about ten percent of the Earth's population was in a country that could reasonably be called a democracy. Mm-hmm. Today, depending upon which measure by political scientists you adopt, that number is something more like sixty percent. So that's an extraordinary change in an extraordinary progress for a democracy in 100, 120 years. Uh, if the U.S. shifted soon to being an autocracy or an authoritarian state, that's about 4% of the world's population. So the bigger picture is uh, that the democracy has actually been doing well. And there are places in Africa that are democracies today that a lot mm-hmm. of people 30 years ago thought would not be democracies today. But that, of course, the problem is we live in the U.S. and we're worried about our democracy. <laughs> and I, we have reason to be worried. We, yeah. Well, you know, nevertheless, I do like to end every podcast when possible on an optimistic note. Uh, Are there any sort of action items you can suggest for those of us who are fans of democracy to uh, either, you know, directly help it along or at least to think about it in the most productive way? Well, vote, first of all, of course, that's the simplest, but that's only one step. I I think one of uh, one of the things that is the the weak points of modern democracy or can be the weak point is that people start to feel very dis- disconnected, disengaged and distrustful of government. Yeah. And, and that is a fundamental problem in the United States today, where you went from a situation where in the 1960s, about three quarters of people said that they trusted the government in Washington to do the right thing most of the time. And now only about 20 percent say that. Hmm. And this has been at 20 percent, both during the Obama and, sure. and Trump administrations. Uh, and so you need to think about what the sources of that distrust are and how people could become more engaged. Uh, and, and, and so I do think that the events um, following uh, the horrible killing of George Floyd nonetheless showed a very bright spot for American democracy in terms of people getting involved uh, and, and protesting peacefully uh, 
in all sorts of areas, not just uh, uh, the usual. It wasn't just the usual suspects uh, yeah. uh, um, in the usual places. There'd be people in a lot of small towns protesting as well. And so I think rediscovering any form of political engagement or expression or debate is is critically important because you know if democracy means power to the people if the people aren't bothered with by you know trying to to have any influence on things then your democracy is going to be pretty unhealthy i like that as a, as a closing message it gives us a little bit of responsibility uh, if if power is supposed to be to the people and we're the people then we have to do something about it not just wait for it to happen yeah i think that ultimately democracy is us we we tend to uh, particularly in recent decades in the U.S., blame the government or yep. something like that. But the, ultimately, democracy is us, and so if we don't do something about it, then then it, it's not gonna it's not gonna work. All right, let's uh, stop listening to podcasts. Let's get out there and do something about it. <laughs> David's to Savage, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you.